On the morning of June the 5th, 1944, U.S. General Dwight Eisenhower announced, OK, we'll go. Within hours, an armada of 3,000 landing craft, 2,500 ships and 500 naval vessels departed English ports to cross the narrow strip of sea to German-controlled Normandy, France. That night, 822 aircraft and gliders deployed troops over landing zones intended to be the vanguard of the whole operation. Seaborne units then began to land on the beaches of Normandy at 6.30 a.m. on the following morning, June the 6th, D-Day. The Allied landings in Western Europe, codenamed Operation Overlord, took two years of preparation and was the greatest amphibious landing in history. So why were the Germans taken so completely by surprise? There are various explanations put forward. School children from the area are still told that the new forest, a vast swathe of ancient woodland across the counties of Hampshire and Dorset, hid the army. This simple description is perhaps enough to deflect awkward questions in the classroom, but does it hide a more disconcerting truth? Critical to events on D-Day was the role of Southampton. In peacetime, a thriving passenger port and a familiar gateway for visitors to the British Isles, it had suffered severely from enemy bombing. As a result, the port had remained idle for some time and much of its cargo handling equipment had been removed to other ports. Yet despite the considerable damage, Southampton remained one of the best ports in England with deep water, relatively little tidal range, as well as an extensive modern quayside and several graving docks for ship repair. Between September 1940 and May 1941, the Luftwaffe made 127 large-scale night raids. Of these, 71 were targeted on London. Other places bombed included Exeter, Liverpool, Birmingham, Plymouth, Bristol, Glasgow, Hull, Manchester and Portsmouth. Southampton, with a population of 180,000, suffered very badly from air raids. At first, its docks and factories were targeted. On the 23rd of November 1940, the German aircraft attacked the city centre with 77 people killed. A week later, Southampton was conventrated. A local man reported every second or two the town was shaken to its foundations. The air was a whirling frenzy. Hot blasts swept the streets. To one who watched from the high ground in a suburb, it looked as if the town had become a blazing furnace in which every living thing seemed doomed to perish. On the 30th of November 1940, Southampton's main telephone exchange was demolished and its water mains were wrecked. The next night, with the firemen injured or exhausted, the bombers came back. Firefighters arrived from 75 other districts. It was reported that apart from the ancient bar gate, the central portion of the town had largely vanished. Nothing remained that was not wilting, wasted or warped. Such walls as remained standing were wet and dripping. 137 people lost their lives and nearly 250 were seriously injured in two days of bombing. It was several weeks before water and gas supplies were restored. A report at the end of December showed that only a fraction of the population was sleeping in the town. By February 1941, most facilities were now back to normal, but public transport stopped at 7 o'clock, and most cinemas, cafes and restaurants, which had not been bombed, also closed early. The better off had moved out of Southampton. The attitude of those who stayed on was summed up by one working-class woman who said, I don't think they will come back. There's nothing to bomb now, is there? Cyril Garbutt, the Bishop of Winchester, visited the city on the 1st of December. He found the people broken in spirit after the sleepless and awful nights. Everyone who can do so is leaving the town. 
Everywhere I saw men and women carrying suitcases or bundles, the children clutching some precious doll or toy, struggling to get anywhere out of Southampton. For the time, morale has collapsed. I went from parish to parish, and everywhere there was fear. Lord Haw Haw, broadcasting propaganda from Germany, said that Southampton docks were completely destroyed. But this was not fake news. The government sent Wing Commander Hodsall to investigate the breakdown in civil defence. His report was highly critical of local authorities from the mayor downwards, but the fact is that because of the damage caused by the air raids, the port was closed for two years to non-essential traffic. One can imagine for weeks to come after the bombing, Luftwaffe pilots in the officers' mess sharing a drink to the night they set Southampton ablaze. The fire lasted over a week and could be seen from as far as Cherbourg on the French coastline. In England, the authorities would much rather take credit for fooling Hitler with the elaborate ruse behind D-Day. The conventional explanation for the German surprise on D-Day cites the disinformation campaign codenamed Operation Bodyguard to induce the enemy to make faulty strategic dispositions in relation to operations by the United Nations against Germany. Bodyguard is often considered the most complex and successful deception effort in the history of warfare. But reading wireless messages, the Allies discovered that the German army believed that the landing would occur at the Par de Calais anyway, so it was easy to feed into their expectations. And here lies the crux of the explanation. The German high command based their conviction on the reasonable expectation arising from events in 1940. When the Allied fleet appeared on the horizon on D-Day, almost the first thought must have been, where did all these ships come from? There was no harbour with deep water and keys to accommodate such a navy. It was an article of faith in the German high command that Southampton was finished in 1940. Lord Haw was not wrong when he broadcast to the world that the docks in Southampton were completely destroyed. The town had become a blazing furnace in which every living thing seemed doomed to perish. The Bishop of Winchester and the working class women who said, I don't think they will come back, there's nothing to bomb now, is there? were not wrong. Yet, although many British officials feared that the port was too vulnerable, when looking for a suitable base for their operations, the Americans reopened it in summer of 1943, and during D-Day to the end of hostilities, the port facilities were shared by the Americans and the British on a day-to-day -day allocation made in accordance with the tactical needs. The heaviest embarkation during D-Day of men and vehicles was over the quaysides and hards at Southampton. In the period from the 6th of June to the 6th of September 1944, 686,868 personnel were embarked at this port on LCIs, MTVs, LSTs, LCIs and LCTs, and 140,303 vehicles were loaded aboard MTVs, LSTs and LCTs. In addition, the port played an important role in the outgoing of cargo, rolling stock and bulk petroleum. Some relief for other ports was afforded shortly after D-Day when responsibility for transmitting documents for all ships loading out of the UK ports was centralised at Southampton. In addition to handling the greatest part of the troop and vehicle embarkation programme, Southampton outloaded a large proportion of the supplies and equipment moved to the continent. The 14th port handled the loading of coasters at Southampton and its subport at Poole, loaded approximately 90% of the rail equipment being shipped to the continent aboard LSTs, sea trains and ferries, and maintained a detachment at Hamble and Forley to assist in the joint loading of British and American tankers. During the first 90 days of the invasion, the 14th port, based at Southampton outloadings, included ammunition, packaged petroleum, general cargo, bulk petroleum, and vehicles totaled 990,341 long tons. 
In the course of loading troops, vehicles and cargo during this period, the port handled no fewer than 3,517 vessels and landing craft. The anchorage area, roughly four miles long by five miles wide, was congested with a fleet comprising at one time of as many as 75 Liberty ships, 20 coasters, 80 LCTs, 10 LCIs, 2 hospital ships, 20 LSTs and approximately 300 smaller craft. Although not glamorous, these were the figures to dislodge the enemy from the Normandy beaches. The German high command was taken by surprise because they did not expect Southampton to be operating as a port because they still believed their own propaganda from 1940. The cloak and dagger techniques employed by Operation Bodyguard saved lives, but were all predicated on the false German premise that Southampton was finished. Therefore, the only reasonable option for an Allied landing was at the Pas de Calais. The reason this narrative has failed to find favour is because it acknowledges the failings of the past which still remain controversial to this day. Yet Southampton rose from the ashes of 1940 to become the principal US port on the south coast and assume the role of de facto headquarters for Operation Neptune from D-Day onwards.